that sound, that theme, that tune used to mean something to me. It meant integrity, it meant accurate information, and it also meant unbiased information. It no longer stands for that. Prince Harry and his wife Meghan have begun a four-day tour of Colombia. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex were invited by the country's vice president for what's been nicknamed a DIY royal tour. Our South America correspondent Ione Wells has more from Bogota. Next, Prince Harry and his wife Meghan have arrived in Colombia for the first stop of a four-day tour of the South American country. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex were invited by the country's vice president for what has been dubbed a DIY royal tour. Our South America correspondent Ione Wells reports from Bogota. The BBC, once celebrated as a bastion of journalistic integrity, is increasingly losing its credibility. With a disturbing trend towards biased and superficial reporting, objectivity, it seems, has become a secondary concern, particularly when covering the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Their recent visit to Colombia, a country rich in culture and history, was dismissed by the BBC as a mere DIY tour. This reductionist characterization not only ignores the profound significance of their visit, but also trivializes the vital causes they champion through their Archwell Foundation. Contrary to the BBC's dismissive reporting, the Duke and Duchess visit the visit to Colombia was far from a casual endeavor. They were there at the invitation of the country's first Afro-descendant woman, Vice President Francia Marquez, to engage in critical discussions on culture, cyberbullying, mental health, Black women in politics, and racism. Their agenda was packed with events that highlighted pressing global issues especially within the context of the Global South. One of the most notable activities was the Rep 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 Responsible Digital Future Summit hosted at the Universidad EAN, e -A -N, one of Latin America's top universities. This summit, organized in partnership with the Office of the Vice President of Colombia and Luminate, brought together thought leaders, activists, and community members to address the urgent need for a healthier and more ethical digital landscape. With a specific focus on online safety in the Global South, the summit shed light on a glaring disparity. While most research on the mental health effects of social media is conducted in the Global North, the Global South, where 88% of the world's population resides, faces unique challenges that are often overlooked. Additionally, the Archwell Foundation hosted an insight session at El Colegio de Cultura in Bogota, where students share their experiences and concerns about the digital world. This session underscored the importance of media literacy, critical thinking, and digital literacy in an area where misinformation and online bullying are rampant. The Duke and Duchess, along with Vice President Marquez, gained valuable insights into how digital technology impacts young people's lives and their communities, highlighting the positive and negative aspects of technology use. The couple's visit also included a journey to San Basilio de Palenque, 
the first free town in the Americas, where they participated in Foro Mujeres Afro y Poder, a forum dedicated to empowering Afro-descendant women in politics and in other areas. Each of these activities was carefully designed to address significant social issues and foster meaningful change. Far from the trivial DIY tour that the BBC portrayed. In stark contrast to the BBC, Latin America media reported the visit with fairness and objectivity, recognizing the substance and importance of the discussions that took place. Their coverage reflected a genuine understanding of the Duke and Duchess's mission and the relevance of the issues at hand. This disparity in coverage is alarming as it reveals the BBC's increasingly departure from the principles of impartiality that once made it a trusted news source. The BBC skewed reporting is not just a disservice to the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, it is systematic of a larger problem within UK media. The misrepresentation of Colombia as a dangerous drug infested and impoverished nation by the UK press perpetuates harmful stereotypes and reflects a deeply ingrained bias that distorts public perception. When an institution like the BBC echo, echoes these biases, it raises serious concerns about its role in shaping narratives and influencing public opinion. <clears throat> this issue extends beyond the Sussex's visit to Colombia. The BBC's failure to report object objectively, objectively on smaller stories like this one, I wouldn't call it a small story, but they may see it that way, and to question its credibility on more significant issues. If the BBC cannot be trusted to provide balanced coverage on events like these, why should the public have faith in its reporting on matters of national or global importance? When the BBC begins to sound more like a tabloid, serving up speculative and negative stories, it undermines the very foundation of democracy, which relies on an informed and accurately informed public. Moreover, the BBC's approach to the Sussex's visit is emblematic of its broader failure to hold power to account. When the BBC overlooks the impacts of government policies, fails to address the issues faced by the most vulnerable, and allows media barons like Rupert Murdoch to wheel on due influence. It betrays its mandate as a public servant broadcaster. The BBC's reluctance to critically examine its own biases, particularly in its coverage of migrants, minorities, and foreign countries, further erodes trust in its reporting. The BBC must, must reassess its editorial standards and return to the principles of fairness and objectivity and once, that once made it a respected institution. The power of the media to shape narratives is immense. And when wheeled in a, in, 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 irresponsibly, it can cause significant harm. The BBC has a responsibility to provide accurate, unbiased coverage that informs rather than misleads the public. In light of these concerns, it is imperative that the BBC to acknowledge its shortcomings and commit to reform. Only by doing so can it hope to regain the trust of its audience and fulfill its role as a reliable pillar of, journal of journalism in the UK. 
If the BBC fails to make these changes, it risks becoming irrelevant. A shadow of its former self, a mere mouthpiece for the establishment. We saw them and just went to say hi. How can I say this? They have an energy. You, 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 you can see it, feel it. It's beautiful. You can notice it the instant they walk into a room. In Cartagena, the couple was greeted with a rendition of Colombia's national anthem and drums to the rhythm of Palenque, a community hit by violence and forced displacement. On that visit, a local elder performed a ritual that, according to tradition, predicts prosperity for the dukes and vice president. To build bridges and open doors that allow us to join forces to make visible and address a problem that today concerns all humanity. After this series of events, Prince Harry and his spouse, Meghan Markle, ended their visit agenda in Colombia with a thematic forum on Afro women and their power in politics. The hope is that the world will see how far we have come. It's been a long time since we have this kind of caliber, this kind of magnitude of the importance of the Duke and Duchess to come and visit. This is the first time that a Duke and Duchess of Sussex have visited Latin America. Also, they met with the Colombian soldiers who went to the Korean War that lasted until 1953. Hey. Hello, good evening, good afternoon, good afternoon. I'd like to start in Spanish. Because we're in your country and my husband and I and I can feel this hug, this embrace from Colombia. It's incredible. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much because the culture, the history, all of this, it's just been like, a, a, it's like a dream, this whole trip. And, and, and please do forgive me if my Spanish is not perfect. Look, I, I, I learned Spanish about 20 years ago in Argentina, but I'm, I'm doing my very best because here I can feel the community. I can feel the sentiment, the feeling. It's the best feeling. It's the best feeling in the world. I want to say thank you. And thank you, Vice President, my friend. Thank you so very much. Whew. Well, now I'm going to sit in English. Así habló en español Meghan Michael, la duquesa de Sussex, durante su visita a Colombia. Ah, porque estamos en su país, y mi marido y yo, y puedo sentir este abrazo de Colombia. Y es increíble. Entonces, gracias, muchas, muchas gracias, porque la cultura, la historia, todo estaba como un sueño, este viaje. Y perdona si mi español no está perfecto, porque yo aprendí hace 20 años en Argentina. Pero estoy tratando, porque acá puedo sentir esta comunidad. Y este es el sentimiento que es lo mejor del mundo ahora. Entonces, gracias a vicepresidenta, mi amiga. Muchas gracias. That was just absolutely beautiful. Now, I am going to take the time as a person who is officially bilingual, a person who at one point in his life spoke four languages. I don't any longer. I am fluent in 
English and in Spanish. My French is not good at all. And my Portuguese has wasted the way of the dodo bird or the tutu bird or whatever that bird is called. Let me say this. For those people who think they know something, but they know nothing. For those people who make their living pretending to understand people's body language. For those people who on their channel or on their whatever is questioning what accent it is that Meghan Markle is speaking Spanish in. For those who would like to criticize and for those who know nothing about nothing but pretend that they know about everything. Let me say this to you. Shut up and sit down. Let me say it again. Shut up and say, Cállate y siéntate. Okay? Cállate y siéntate. Would you like me to say it in another language? Because I could say those actually in French and in Portuguese. Sit down. How dare you? Ridiculousness. Now let me explain something for people who pretend like they know things but know nothing. When a person learns a language, it's not your mother tongue, you're learning a language. When you are in that environment, let's say you learn it in school. When you learn a language in school, your capacity of really speaking it is okay. It's not great. It's okay. When you go and you live in a place that speaks the language, your capability of speaking that language improves enormously. Thus, you start to speak very well, right? You start to speak pretty fluently. Now, what happens? When you speak a language, especially when it comes to Spanish, there are many countries that have Spanish as their language, right? Each country in Latin America, in South America, Central America, each one of them have a different way of speaking Spanish. Let me explain. Megan at one point said, well, I didn't really learn Spanish. What I learned was Castellano. Now, Castellano is basically Spanish, but it's from Castillas. Castilla is a region in Spain. Castilla is where Christopher Columbus went to the king and the queen and got the money in order to get on the boat and the Santa Maria and the Pinto and whatever else. And this, quote unquote, discovered this land. I mean, he didn't discover it. There's people already here. But you know what I mean, right? So the language that originally was, was given or was obligated to speak that you know, all these Spanish countries speak or Latin countries speak is originally known as Castellano because it's from Castillas. Now, as time has progressed, it sort of adapted that, okay, we'll not say we speak Castellano you know, Castellano, we'll just say we speak Espanol, which is Spanish. So people don't get so confused. Now, every region has a different way of speaking. Venezuela has its own accent and has different ways of speaking. Colombia, Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay, Costa Rica, Mexico, Dominican Republic, all of them each one has a different accent. And they use, yes, we have, right? We have what we call sort of the dictionary normative Spanish. But every single region or country takes certain words or they have colloquial words that is not used in different places. Let me say this to you. Spanish is my mother town. Now, when I've gone to Mexico, there are things that Mexicans will say within their language that I just look at them and go, I have no idea what you just said. 
there are times when I've been in Argentina and they'll say something and be like, I have no idea what you just said. There's times when I've been in Colombia and I'll say, can you repeat that again, but slower? Now, and that is my mother town. So this idea that she should just speak a certain way and a certain accent, or you don't, you're not sure what accent she's speaking with, shut up and sit down. Now, when I heard her speak, because I've heard before when she was doing promos for suit, right? She has words that she pronounces very Argentinian-like. Because Argentinians speak with a she, she. So like a song. She te digo, right? It's almost like a mix with Italian also. Because there's a lot of Europeans that live, that, that immigrated from Europe to Argentina. Especially after World War II. So they have a, a, a distinctive accent that one can pick up. Now, if you also went to Spain and learn in Spain, Spain is very different. Spain is like, sa, sa, sa. You know, it's very, sa, sa, sa. It's, it's so that your tongue, it gets caught between your teeth and, and, and the way they pronounce their Zs and their Ss and the way they pronounce their Zs and their Ss are very different than most parts in Latin America. So having those two convulsed for a person who has learned the language, there are certain times you may pronounce certain things a certain way. For example, in Spain, they say zapato, right? With a Z, zapato. But in most parts of Latin America, they say zapato, as if it were written with an S instead of a Z. So, it all differs. What's the important thing here is what she understood. She is clear as really good water up in the Alps, coming down from, uh, <laughs> coming down from, <laughs> I can't even say it. <laughs> You know, this serves me well for trying to be funny because I'm not, I'm not funny at all. <laughs> trying to be funny, but I'm not. But listen, the bottom, the bottom line is everything she said was clear. Everything she said was well said and pronounced well. So for those, and you know who you are in case you're ever watching this channel or you see this or you listen to this, Sit down. I like to say something else that begins with an F, but I'm not going to because I'm classy that way. So I'm just going to say, sit down and shut up. That's it, right? Now let me give you something that even within Spanish-speaking countries, here is a story for you. And I might have told this story before. I'm not sure. So there is a very famous singer from Spain, and there was some rumors going around that uh, he might be into same gender. I'm just saying this. I'm, I'm not coming and saying it what it is because, like, I'm not sure if if if, if the artist is out or not out. I, I'm not sure. Actually, I should look it up. But this this artist came to Venezuela, and they were interviewing him. Now, they said to him, uh, one of the questions was, what do you like the most thus far of Venezuela? This is your first time here. And he said, pues, pues, me gusta las palomas. Las palomas me encantan. So, in other words, he said, I love the doves. I love doves. Doves here are really beautiful. So, dove is paloma. Paloma, the real significance of Paloma, Paloma is dove. Universally, that's what it is. That's the word. Paloma is a dove. But in Spain, they call women Palomas, right? At that time, I don't know if they still do, but they would refer to a woman, a beautiful woman, as esa Paloma, right? That, that beautiful woman. So they use Paloma, dove, for a woman. 
and that's the colloquial way. In Venezuela, we didn't use Paloma for a beautiful woman. We use Paloma for something else. And that something else is the genital of a man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> so perhaps you can see where this is going. So he kept saying, I love Palomas. I love them so much. And the interviewer kept looking at him going, um, are you sure? <laughs> so give me one moment. <coughs> Okay, all right, I'm better now. Got some water, I'm good. So, um, it was all over the news that this artist had come out, that he's basically saying he likes Venezuelans. Okay, and I guess whether it was his publicist or some someone like quickly <laughs> that evening said, listen, like you messed up. So then he was on TV again, trying to like correct himself and said, no, what I meant to say was the women, because in Spain we say Paloma for women. But now I, I found out that here in Venezuela, you guys call Paloma a guy's junk, basically, right? So that's just to illustrate how certain things and certain words can be used for something different depending on the country that you're in. And I would say, last but not least, anyone who has learned a language would know that if you don't practice that language, you will lose it. So I learned French. I was pretty okay with French. I could maintain a conversation. Ask me today to maintain a conversation. Good luck. I spoke Portuguese, not as well as I spoke French. Ask me to speak Portuguese today. Niente. No, no, doesn't happen. So Megan learned Spanish 20 years ago, as she indicated. Now, the thing that many times may happen is that once you're in an environment where that language is spoken, your, your, your memory bank, right? Because stuff is at the back here somewhere um, and your subconscious, because you, you've learned the language, so it's there somewhere, may open a window and you have access to it again. Now, if you stay longer, it opens two windows, then it opens a door. So it comes back to you, right? Sometimes not the same way, but it comes back to you. So uh, I just spent, what, 18 minutes talking about language? Okay, enough. Enough. This has been a very emotional, I think, um, visit. And it's been emotional for me as some of you may have witnessed, like I get choked up at certain things and this, you know, the, the day three and four were even more so because I kept looking at things and I kept just tearing up all the time. And I kept wondering like, why am I tearing up? Why is this so emotional for me? And there are two things. One is I've been watching a lot of how the vice president, Francia Marquez, is treated. Oh, damn it, I'm going to get emotional again. I loved the woman. The disrespect, the disrespect that they showed to that woman is unbelievable. Unbelievable. She's continuously called stupid. She's continuously continuously said that she's mispronouncing words 
and being corrected. She is told, and this, this, this is on national TV. This is on radio syndicated shows. And I think I'll, I'll show you folks some, some of it. I'm not going to show you all because I don't think I'll get through it. But I'll just show you a couple just, just to illustrate what I'm trying to say. I don't like to get into to, to, <coughs> to local politics of a country. I don't live there. I don't know what, 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 what the ins and outs are about certain things. And, but just as an outsider who is now peeking in into the politics of what is being said, you know, you have people from Argentina coming into the country and saying these things about this woman saying that she only got her position because she's black and she's a woman, that she's incapable of even reading properly, that she should have never gotten that position, and they don't understand why she's getting these awards. Okay, so I had to stop myself there for a few minutes. And um, before I have no voice left, I'm going to stop here. And I'll do a separate um, episode on Madame Vice President and the struggles and stuff that she deals with. I hope that's okay with everyone. I'm so sorry. I should have not kind of prepped this. And then I was getting really just, I guess, passionate is the word. Um, but I'm realizing that. Yeah, I need to kind of just stop it. And hopefully I'll have a voice tomorrow. All right. Thank you all. I'll talk to you soon. Ciao.